Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, April 25th, 2019 regular uh, meeting of the school committee and public hearing. So I would ask for those who are in attendance here in the studio, if you'd like to rise with us to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we are fortunate to have a number of people here in the audience that we will recognize tonight, uh, but we're going to start, um, do we want to start with recognition since we don't have anyone here? Sure. The, yeah. Yeah. All right, yes, so let's move right along to recognitions. Uh, we have a few of them. Uh, Larry Keene, who is the head custodian at Hopkinton High School will be retiring, and even though um, he's not able to be here with us tonight, I did want to read his Certificate of Appreciation uh, because he has been with us for almost 20 years, and he does a wonderful job. So in recognition of your outstanding commitment to Hopkinton High School, this certificate is presented to Larry Keene. He's been with us from September 5th, 2001 to May 1st, 2019, and this is awarded to him on this 25th day of April 2019. So, um, Larry, if you do see the... <laughs> um, the broadcast of this, I, I wish you all the best and a wonderful retirement. And I did the same this morning when I ran into him at the high school. So, thank you. Um, our second one, I would like for uh, Mr. Mike Hamilton to come up, please. Which, which one of these seats? Any one of those is perfectly fine. <laughs> the lavish one. Yeah. <laughs> So Mr. Hamilton has been invited here tonight because he has been awarded uh, the Mary Margaret Moffitt Memorial Teaching Excellent Award, and that is offered by the American Psychological Association. Um, when I first met Mr. Hamilton, it came about because every summer he um, has a group of psychology teachers who come together, and they're from all over New England. Um, and even further, and they all come together at Hopkinton High School. And they do that because teaching psychology at the high school level is kind of one of those interesting disciplines because it's sort of a singleton. If you're a math teacher or an English teacher, uh, there is lots of professional learning for you, but when you are a psychology teacher or an AP psychology teacher, uh, you're kind of out there on an island, and so you look for your colleagues to conduct your own professional learning. Uh, so before I tell any more about this, Mike, I'm going to ask you to talk about how NETOP was founded. Yeah. Uh, it's, you did a pretty good job of describing the, the need for psychology teachers to have high-quality professional development and trying to do it at as low a cost as you can. So for most of the psych professional development opportunities, there are national conferences that by the time you're invested in it, it's thousands of dollars to go to, which lots of people can't do. And they often end up at times of the year when you can't go. So uh, when I was working with um, an APA division, teachers of psychology in secondary schools, one of our main goals was trying to find ways to create regional networks so teachers could come from New England, for example, uh, and get together, network, and have s s good uh, professional development at a reasonably low cost. And it's been wonderful. We've done, this is going to be our eighth year of doing NETOP at Hopkinton. So again, thanks to Hopkinton for allowing us to, to do it in the, in the high school. But uh, we've, had, we've had great growth. We had 20, 25 people, 25 psych teachers from this area the first time we did it. And we've had as many as 75 teachers. Uh, I think our highest number of states where we drew participants from one year was 11. Uh, which randomly we had people from Texas and a couple from Ohio and Kansas. So uh, it's, been, it's been a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I think it's great for the district to host it, and I think it's been great for, for people, particularly in New England, to have one opportunity at least to get a great professional development day uh, during, the, during the year. So thank you. We should be thanking you for that. Yes. You should be thanking us. Whenever you can put us on the map, we're appreciative. So I'll tell you a little bit about the Mary Margaret Moffitt Memorial <coughs> Award. Uh, each year, it's been given since 1981, and there's one recipient each year. And the award criteria are effective and innovative teaching of scientific psychology, 
stimulation of student interest in psychology, evidence showing use of national standards for high school psychology curricula, and professional development. Um, and I would just ask you to talk a little bit about how you meet those criteria mm -hmm. um, and how you get that award. Okay. Uh, so the award, to, the process started, uh, I was nominated by a professor that teaches at Albion College in Michigan, uh, who I work with on the national level at the AP Psych Reading. So I've done various things in, in, in the AP Psych Reading. And uh, so he nominated me this year. And then the process is to get a number of recommendations and uh, letters of reference from people who know what I do and know it well. And then the, the, the criteria that you talked about, uh, particularly just a couple of them that uh, that I'd speak out a little bit about, uh, the participation in the student interest. We have, uh, as you probably know, we have what may be the most inclusive AP psychology program in the country. And it's wonderful not only that it's inclusive, but it's also successful. Students do very well and seem to enjoy the experience, or at least they report they enjoy the experience. Uh, so we have a very inclusive uh, program, which helps with as evidence of, yeah, we have student interest, and we also have a lot of students that go on to major in, in psychology and then to go on for advanced degrees in psychology. Uh, the other one, the professional development piece of that, doing things like NETOP definitely were, were a part of that. But I also, at present, I'm co-chair of the AP Psychology Test Development Committee. So there, there are a number of things like that at the national level that I'm involved with that uh, certainly were, provided evidence, uh, evidence for the professional development. And then in terms of the teaching, showing teaching of psychological science, that was a just putting together a whole lot of lessons that we do and demonstrations that we do and you know, using formative and summative assessments in ways that, that further build student understanding and, and uh, development in their psychological knowledge. So I guess I would sort of like to point out that when you, know, you take a math class, it's an AP course, you've had years and years and years of math building to it. When you take you know, an AP English course, you've had years of building to it. But as we said, psychology is one of those singletons. Um, and you know you have an awful lot of kids who are enrolling that to give you the largest high school program uh, in the country. And I think it's important to point out that um, while you are teaching this thing to the singleton, kids encounter it for the very first time. Our um, mean score at the high school last year was a 4.771 out of 5. So you are doing an amazing job teaching that course. And obviously, you know, your passion is quite evident. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about what um, Mr. Bishop had to say. Um, he wanted everyone to know that Mr. Hamilton teaches AB Psych, Intro to Psych, uh, U.S. History too, and that you are an incredibly dedicated, caring, talented, and student-centered teacher. Um, you are a favorite among your students, well-respected among your peers, a leader in the field of psychology, um, and one of the founders of NETOP. Um, he's very proud of the fact that you have a conference in his building every summer. Um, and we are all very proud of you receiving this prestigious award. So thank you for coming here tonight. And, I, thank you, know, you for having me. I yeah. appreciate the oh, opportunity no. to come and it's talk an with honor. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It is thank an you. honor. And, and oh, thank I feel you. I like we should clap. Yeah. 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 Maybe they should <laughs> clap. We sent something off in the audience. But it really, it's something I know that kids start talking about early on in their high yeah. school career of, of wanting to get into that class and what a phenomenal job you do of igniting their spark in the subject in, as a whole, but to go on and to have such high AP scores is amazing. Um, so thank you. And thank I've you. I've never had the opportunity to be in your class, of course, but my son did, and um, I mean, he still talks about what you what you taught him. And I think um, he's not a psych student; he's an engineer. But mm -hmm. I think you know, doing that, uh, taking your class, it really opened up so many new areas of interest, and um, he has nothing but the highest things to say. So thank you for yeah. that and the well, stimulation you. that you give to the kids and. You really get them thinking. So. Yeah, and it's it's wonderful uh, to teach. As you said, it's not a class where they have a lot of things that build up to it, uh, but it is a class that you, you can make relevant every single day that you're teaching it and tying it to their lives, which is why I think you see, even though you're an engineering major, there's lots of psych involved in engineering mm -hmm. and any other walk of life. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations again.
Thank you so much. It's an honor. All right. So uh, my next um, recognition goes to our national merit finalists. Uh, you can see that we have some students in the audience. I'm going to read the names of all of the recipients. And then I will ask you all to come up and say a little bit. Okay. So here we go. Um, from the class of 2020, uh, we have students who are going to um, receive recognition in the National Merit Scholarship Program of some sort. We have Cassidy Barada. <laughs> <laughs> Fletcher Clark, Anila Asun, Timothy Fargiano, Kian Fadhi, Hannah Ionelli, Megan Kalmbach, Max Lakasha, Kevin Liu, Alexander Matsukis, Amun Marada, uh, Advayat Nene, Matvey Ortyashov, Cody Ottinger, Thrusha Putaraju, Elan Rosen, Joe Wang, Sarah Weisinger, and Grace Yee. And then in 2019, we have National Merit Commended students. They are Matthew Bianculi, Sarah Cahill, Matthew Dempsey, Priya Hedge, Ava Curavilla, Grace Lim, Matthew Long, Andrew Paleko, Tess Papagni, Claudia Stett, Jane Stillwell, Alexander Wojcik. Uh, we have Francesco Duca for the National Hispanic Scholar. And we had two National Merit semifinalists, Abigail Fisher and Sarah Kang, and a single National Merit finalist, Abigail Fisher. So congratulations to all of those students. Um, and you know that the PSAT is the qualifying test for this. And so I'm going to ask you all to come up and just say who you are. And in a couple of sentences, just tell us a little bit about yourselves. You're a little <laughs> come right on over. You can all come at once if you don't want. Yeah, you don't have exactly. It makes it easier. You can do it. You may have to get a little bit closer so the microphone picks up your voice. Um, I'm Hannah Ianelli. I'm a junior at Hawking High School. Um, I play on the Hawking and Field Hockey and Hawking Lacrosse teams, and I'm very honored for this award. Congratulations. Yes, thank congratulations. You. Um, I'm Grace Yee. I'm a junior at Hopkinton High School, and I run track, and I do figure skating, and I'm really honored for this award, so thank you. Congratulations. Uh, I'm Adwait Nene. I'm also a junior at Hopkinton High School. Um, I enjoy playing in the band, and uh, I'm also pretty honored to uh, receive this commendation. I'm... I'm Max Lakasha. I'm a junior. Um, I'm a captain of the football team. Um, I'm very proud to receive this award. Congratulations. Um, I'm Sarah Weisinger. Um, I'm also a junior. Um, I do dance and like swim and stuff, and I'm honored to get this award. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, we are honored to have you here tonight. Um, when you you know, take the PSAT. You are among the highest achievers, and we don't just mean in Hopkinton. We mean among all of the test takers in, you know, the United States and elsewhere. So uh, this is really quite Thank an you. honor, and we are happy that you are here. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to all of you. Good very job. big deal. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> I know, I'm having trouble too. I usually oh, I go on. I know, it, it okay. used and to, I'll just but mention it's... The three, um, I wonder if we should ask. Students who won the Alpha Mega Awards. Okay. Mm. Uh, and then our last recognition tonight. Uh, about a week ago, we were all um, in the Hall of Flags at the State House, and um, our Hopkinton Middle School Girls Chorus uh, was there to perform the national anthem in both uh, the, the American national anthem in English and the Greek national anthem in Greek. Uh, but the excitement of that evening, I think, is that we had three middle school students who were um, recognized for the essays that they had written, and those students are Ashwath Sridhar, Anoush Kader, and Iona Salibas. So I did want to mention them as well under recognitions. 
And I think that those are all of my recognitions for tonight. Quite a few some good ones, yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah, great night for that. So at this point, I would like to open the public hearing regarding our uh, strategic planning. Uh, I don't know if you guys wanted to speak to, to that in addition to student council stuff, but uh, I do not see anybody else here from the public. I don't know if anybody on the committee wanted to speak to the uh, strategic priorities. Not required, but I figured if it's a public hearing. Could we, could we let the, um, the, these folks give their report and then just keep it open? For a little we while. can. Is that we okay? can keep the public. That way, we don't have to keep these. They, yeah. He told me he's studying for um, oh, an enormous yes. amount of AP oh. exams oh. coming up. So I, <laughs> I was feeling like maybe he might want to get back to that. Come on up. <laughs> Which AP exams are you studying for? I'm studying for um, AP Calc, um, AP Lang, AP Chem, and AP US History. Wow. Yes, yes. you better get this. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, you let, let them go. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> so my name is Will Dion, and I'm a junior. And I'm Colby Michaud, and I'm a sophomore. And I'm both on student council. <laughs> All right, uh, so starting things off, going back in time a little bit to before vacation, uh, we had Micah hosted at HHS. The orchestra, chorus, and band all performed. Um, for the first time in quite a while, they received silver medals. Is very good. Um, we had a mini college fair for the sophomores and juniors to attend. It went well. Um, the seniors had their 50 days to graduation dinner and also this year a record number of senior projects with 100 students. I believe the previous was 48? 40. Yeah. 40. Oh, wow. 40 so, was the previous high? Yes, so wow. immense growth in our senior project program. Um, additionally, um, another program that we're proud of at HHS is our Unified um, Sports Program, and they had their first home meet yesterday, um, and there was um, a good um, a good number of people attending that, um, so that was awesome to see people supporting their classmates um, in that um, sport. Um, additionally, um, tomorrow morning um, is a Hiller Day, but in the cafeteria we have our collegiate um, athlete breakfast, so for um, Seniors who are who will be playing sports in high school or in college, um, there will be a breakfast for them. Um, additionally, uh, another exciting thing at HHS is our robotics team is in Kentucky uh, for robotics nationals. So we're super excited about that, um, and we're excited to see how they will um, do um, in their competitions. Uh, additionally, um, this May second, um, we have another college fair coming up. Again, for the um, for the sophomores and the juniors, um, and finally, um, on Friday, May third, we have a be free um, spring jam event, uh, which is a really positive. Um, for those who don't know, uh, be free is a club um, in which they host um, uh, events for students um, to gather and socialize um, and to be substance free. Um, so I've been to a couple, and they're they're super fun events. Um, so we're excited for that. And finally, um, the BPA, the Business Professionals of America Club, um, will also be heading to Nationals um, next Wednesday. And they'll be going to Anaheim, California. So it'll be pretty cool to see how they do as well. Pretty exciting. Yeah. yeah. You guys are so, all over the country. Yeah, we're <laughs> quite busy at HHS. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a lot going on. There is, but it's great the diversity of different things that are exactly, going on. It's, yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. And in the midst of all the AP studying for people. I know. Right? Yep. right? That'll be you next year, right? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yes, it will be. That's what you got to look forward to. <laughs> so excited. We'll make sure you go first next year, too. Okay? We'll make sure we get to it. We'll look out for yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How generous. Right, I know. Yeah. <laughs> if we can help, yeah. Gonna... Good luck with your 47 AP. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the report, too. It's good to hear all the good things going on. Any other questions? And it's diversity month at the high school? Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. Absolutely. So Diversity Club has been um, been doing certain events, so that has been pretty cool to see as well. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. Thanks. Lovely. Yeah. Thanks so much. Right. Okay. Thank you. No good luck for your Thank you very much. Have a good rest of your night. Thank you. Thank you. You too. All right. Well, we will swing back then into our public hearing on the strategic priorities. If anybody had anything they wanted to... No internet connectivity. I know that that 
it's, should have been taken care of earlier. That's but all right. It, backstage I, I, is it's not working. Robot B dash okay. nine is the right. is the oh. actual network. Uh, that's okay. That changes everything. Fair enough. Thank you. Just because it's really hard to see that from here. So. Uh, that would, but I believe that's probably able see to. What? They can oh, is see that what? Viewers at home, I believe, can see it. Yes, they can see it. It's right there. Oh, I got the onion problem. <laughs> Bob, Bob, where were you closer, five minutes ago? Closer, <laughs> closer, Bob, closer. Thank you, thank you, oh, Bob. Dear. <laughs> Wi Fi, thank Bob's you. Good We're just trying to get you on camera, Bob. <laughs> he knows where the camera's are. I know. <laughs> Appreciate your help. <laughs> oh, sorry. this is really crazy. It worked. <laughs> well, I'm excited about the strategic priorities. I'll start the conversation. Yeah, okay. I, I think um, I was really excited to see how this came together. I know a lot of work went into it, and it's kind of nice to see it's sort of crystallized into the, the list of priorities. Um, you know, I was struck sort of at the high level, you know, sort of the, the plan for enrollment growth, um, all the sort of pieces that need to be put in place and worked on to support the other two columns. That's kind of how mm -hmm. I looked at it. And, and the other two columns, um, you know, I think are spot on in terms of valuing the individual, but also maintaining that um, focus on the community. And it's, there's always that sort of tension. It's sort of a push-pull, you know, are we prioritizing, you know, individualized learning or, you know, anything specific to one person or are we maximizing for the, for the whole school? And I think we work really hard to do both. And I think it's exciting to see them equally placed in the strategic priorities. So that was um, great. Um, I, I really liked in the um, second column the emphasis on growth mindsets. Um, I'm really I'm a big proponent of not being afraid to try things and fail and grow and learn. So I loved seeing that in there. Um, I think it was ambitious, and I like it that we had build budgets that propel innovation. I know in the midst of all our growth, it's easy to just think about just getting by and, and somehow keeping an eye on innovation um, by pu putting this top, like right here in the strategic plan, I think is important. It's gonna be challenging for us to figure out how to do that, but I think it's important mm -hmm. to keep it on the radar and keep focused on it. So that was great. Um, and the only, um, w the only thing on here that, you know, I think I sent you a comment too, it was hoping to get eventually more clarity on was um, around ways that we can improve on the bottom of the green, the communication, the growing the partnerships between families and schools. I think it's a really important bullet. And there's a lot, there are a lot of different ways to go about that. So I'm excited to see how we work at that. Yes. And so, you know, just, uh, I guess to sort of illuminate the conversation that we've had electronically, um, one of the things that Mrs. Fargiano had said is that her own experience is that we are very good at doing that on the micro level. And I agree. Mm -hmm. You know, when parents call us with a concern, we're really responsive to that. Principals are always sending information out. When there's a problem with an individual child, we pick up the phone and, and all of that. But I do think that on that macro level, there's a whole lot that school professionals know, teachers know, principals know, um, central office administrators know, and it would really be nice to start to share that information with people who are sort of thirsty for it. So I think that that's an excellent goal for us in the future. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I like and, that. And I think, you know, your team, the admin team, the um, teachers, the subject matter, matter leaders, we have so many sort of thought leaders who have really put a lot of time into mastering their disciplines. And, you know, if you have the occasion to kind of ask a question, you know, in the hall or when you see them, you realize, wow, there's a whole wealth of knowledge there. And sometimes I always feel like, wouldn't it be great if the whole community could tap that? So if we could find some mechanism um, to connect some of that professional knowledge and perspective with the community, I think it'd be great. Yes, and I think maybe one vehicle for that will be the new website. When that is launched. Let's hope that so. Might, yeah, we've got a lot going on. There's a lot of balls in the air. Yeah. But yes, I think that that would be really good. If, you know, the the website was sort of another sort of conduit, right? Good job. Um, just two comments. So I really like all the goals, and and I hope that we can make real inroads into each of them. Um, diversity, in particular, interests me. Um, as it connects to this communication and stakeholder partnership because I think the schools do such a wonderful job of acknowledging and celebrating student difference 
And I hope that we can take that acknowledgement and celebration and spread it out across town mm -hmm. um, so other town departments and officials understand the different kinds of difference. Okay, that was repetitive, but you know what I mean. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, difference in ability to and to understand before judging. Mm -hmm. um, so connecting those two would be really important to me. I also like honoring advancing diversity awareness and as it applies to curriculum, um, but also thinking about increasing diversity of staff as part of that. And I know it's tricky. Mm -hmm. I know it is, but the more I read, the more the research tells me that students benefit from having teachers who look like them. Mm -hmm. You know, simply put, they really do. Mm -hmm. They feel more confident about themselves. So I look forward to our conversations about that in the future. All right. Well, what I appreciated most about it is being at that public forum and seeing the, the chart paper with all the um, Alan furiously scribbling as people <laughs> gave out their suggestions. I feel like um, that all of those pieces were put together, and I don't think anything's missing. So I feel like it really speaks to what the, the folks who came to that forum were really looking for. Um, and I mean, you know, as I, everyone has already, already said, that seems to speak probably for the community in general. I can't imagine, I mean, I'm sure someone could come up with something else, but this is really, this is like at the core of all the things that the community is looking forward to. So I think it's great. I echo what other people said, but I also really appreciate the readability of this and how it is, you can look at one page, but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's like 10,000 times better than it's, a 40 <laughs> page document. Right, 10,000 yeah. times better. It's clear. I like the way it's, the whole thing is done. Yep. So. And I've, I know some folks not on the school committee who looked at it and they were like, so much easier to read, you know, <laughs> like, you go figure, one page, even with colors, so you can kind of draw your eyes to different sections. It's yeah, right. it, my husband's like, that's how every strategic plan should be. Isn't that how the last one was? I'm like, no, exactly. no, it wasn't. So, but yeah. in the ease of reading it, I think we'll get more people involved in understanding what it is. Yes, and, and I, I hope that yeah. is one of the outcomes. I really do. Right. Yeah. And it's an easier yeah. reference, too, if you're using it to guide whatever budgeting or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. it, you don't need to sift through 40 pages of, of language. You're looking at one. Pick your color. Are you looking at green? Are you looking at yellow? It's much easier. Yeah. So what are the next steps from here? So what will become of this document? There will be a uh, very broad-based district improvement plan, and from that district improvement plan, each of the building principals will build their school improvement plans. Uh, when we get the district improvement plan draft up and running, it will come here, and you know certainly we can do another public hearing for people to come and take a look at that as well. Because under each one of these broad categories, there will sort of be those kinds of action steps, but how is this actually enacted? How will it be manifest at our level, at the building level? That's important. Okay. Great. Yeah, All right. I like it. So at this point, then, I would seek a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Second. Mandel, that? No, you go ahead. Go for it. All, All right. right. So motion by Jen. Second. Second, Second. by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And the public hearing is closed. Thank you very much. And thank you for all of the work yeah, that went behind. Yeah, it came out it. really, really well. So that brings us into reports. Uh, and item B is a financial report by Ms. Rothermick. Thank you. Um, as you can see from the, the cover page, in, in summary, we're still running a, a positive variance at this point in time. Um, a couple of things have changed. The, the payroll, not so much. The payroll has stayed relatively the same as um, the last time. Um, but within the expense, you'll see a couple things that I have increased. Um, one being legal. I anticipate our legal budget um, going over between now and the end of um, the fiscal year. And the other one are the uh, color copiers. As, as we renewed our lease for some of our copiers and looking for more efficient ways of printing and more cost-effective ways of printing, um, we're really moving toward moving people to print to copiers and getting away from the individual printers which are much more costly to maintain. Um, one of the things that we still need to get on top of really are the controls around that. Um, so that will be more of a push for next year. This was really, um, here's the copiers, please use them as we take away your individual printers. 
Um, so that'll be something for really changing a mindset um, and for, for staff to get used to. So that's, that's what those two really um, are the changes. And for utilities, as we start to creep away from the heating season, um, you know, we'll start to understand where we can come under budget mostly in, in the heating. Um, so I believe at this point in time, all the boilers have been shut off at the schools. So while we get mm -hmm. warmer mornings, um, you know, I think the buildings will still stay comfortable, uh, but that will continue to save money for us as well. I forget, do we have air conditioning at Marathon? Do we? Yes. Marathon, yes. So that's still, that'll be an interesting unknown, right, to see what that ends up running. Yeah, I mean, Marathon was, is still an unknown yeah. um, because last year we were in the commissioning. Right. So you're running it full tilt. Um, so this will be the first usability, but at the same time, we're still exercising in, in um, getting those controls. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you have a building management control, so you still have to work through the bugs of that. So, so Marathon, I anticipate probably two years of experience before you really get an understanding of what that building will run. Okay. Yeah. So with the air conditioning, it, it's sort of the philosophy, philosophy behind Marathon that it's just kept it one kind of trying to keep it at a constant temperature, or do, in the warmer months do they try to offset with opening the windows, for example? I don't know. Well, what you with the building management system, right. you're setting a temperature control, so you're setting that comfort zone, and so if it's in it, once you turn on air conditioning, right. if the room temperature gets hot, you know, in the spring you're probably opening a window, but as it gets more okay, intense, so that it it's not just constantly triggering on that there's right. some judgment being made of that's correct. You know, okay, that's. Correct. That was the answer I was hoping for, but <laughs> yeah. So I mean, now that we've yeah. turned off the heat, we have not turned on the that's air. Thing, that's good. <laughs> if that's Thank the you. Question, that is exactly the where answer I was is going no. With. Thank you. <laughs> We're trying to take a pause on utilities. I'm, for a while. Yes. I, I'm in favor of pauses. Yes. Pause. Yes. Yes. Yep. Uh, Mrs. Rotherman, can I ask you a question about the legal budget going over? Because I'm sure people listening might mm -hmm. want to know why that is. I mean, can you say anything more about it? Uh, I mean, most of it is really confidential, so there's, there's not much you can say. But, okay. you know, it um, year by year, it's hard to determine exactly what may come up during the year. Okay. Um, so it, it can be a variety of things. It, it can be um, staff issues. It can be student need issues. It can be, um, you know, just a, just a variety of of things that can come up. So it's it's hard to determine on an annual basis what that will be. Okay. So. Does it tend to increase year by year? If you look at it, there really is not a pattern. If okay. you look at the last five years, you, it, you know, it goes up and up and down. Um, last year, I would say we had a lot of struggles with um, freedom of information requests that cost you know, that ended up with legal review as well. So, you know, things things like that, it just, it's a, it runs the gamut. It's hard to say what exactly is going to be the pattern. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And contract negotiations. My, my recollection was we cut the legal, we reduced legal from last year to this year. Is that accurate? No. Or I, okay. No. Yeah. We, we ran over in legal last year last as well. year okay um but again if you look at le the last five years um you know our budget right. is not completely out of normal it's just right. some year some years we hit it some years we doubled it well and some years we have significant contract negotiations that are heavy mm -hmm. in legal fees right yeah. so. All right. Good question. okay that yes okay uh, so I just have a couple of some school based things for starters um, this slide the two things that you see on there were sent to uh, me from Deb Pinto and John Parker uh, both middle school PE wellness teachers and they have you know, as they do every year this kind of workout stuff that they do before the kids actually go 
and take the MCAS test. But this year the kids actually got the why do we do this, the changing your brain um, slide, which I really liked. So I wanted to incorporate it here. Um, so it talks about the chemicals that are released in, in your brain when you, you know, start to physically move and what those outcomes are on, on sort of learning huh. and your demeanor and all of that. And I just thought that was such a nice way mm -hmm. to, you know, kind of get kids to think about moving and learning um, and the relationship between the two. We also, we had gone to the Boston Marathon wreath ceremony. Um, that's where we had our three students, um, Ashworth, Anushka, and Iona, who were um, recognized there. In the bottom right, you can see uh, former Governor Mike Dukakis, who was there in, for a man in his 80s, his speech was quite delightful. Uh, and then above that, you can see our Hopkinton Middle School Girls Chorus. They did a beautiful job singing. and. You can see the mayor of Boston there with uh, five esteemed colleagues, <laughs> one of whom <laughs> is our own school committee chair. Uh, this is the Elmwood Kenyon Runner Day, always exciting. You can see the Kenyans you know, dancing with the kids. You can see the part where all the confetti goes off. It's just so exciting. I mean, you watch those children and it's just sort of pure joy. Mm, they are great. so excited. And here is the Unified Track Home Opener that, and um, so Bob can actually play that video. I can't do it from here. When they make the bridge, it's so exciting. One of those things that's just so emotional. They recognized the other team last year. Did they do that again yeah, this they year? Did. That's they came through as well. Yeah, really nice. Um, and so now we get to the part where I have uh, just a little bit of my goals update. This is a reminder of what the five goals were: um, to establish a three-year strategic plan for the Hopkinton Public Schools, to build the repertoires of administrators, faculty, and staff, and cultural sensitivity and diversity with the hopes of ensuring greater social and psychological safety for our students, uh, to build my own repertoire as the district's instructional leader through participation in the NISA program, to enhance reading and writing instruction at the high school for special educators and special education students, especially as students prepare for the revised MCAS test this spring, which they have uh, already taken and to develop a budget reflective of students' learning needs as well as the expanding population in the district. I just have a couple of slides that go with these goals. We've already taken a look at that one. Um, so this was really exciting for me. Uh, Jen and I went to hear Zaretta Hammond speak, and she is the person who wrote that book that we had done as a group over the summer, hmm. Culturally Responsive Teaching. And it was interesting for me because when we were going through the process of creating the strategic plan, I can remember being in a, a group where we were talking about sort of culture and diversity. And what emerged from that group was that we're really functioning on two levels. One is that sort of social level where kids are interacting with each other in our buildings. But that second level is how do we adapt our curriculum so that it has it's reflective of social justice and conscious of you know, who our learners are every day. And so when we went to hear Zaretta Hammond speak, she said, you have to think about this actually at three levels. One is um, you look at it through the lens of multicultural ed education, and that's where we're sort of celebrating who each person is. And then you have to think about that social justice education. Um, and then finally, we get teachers to a place where they are able to uh, participate in what we would call culturally responsive education. And I really liked how she had broken those things out, three things out. Um, it just made a whole lot of sense, and she had very nice bulleted pieces. And she said, no, not one of these things is more important than the other. There may be a sort of continuum, because you don't get to that third column, maybe without a lot of readiness in the first two columns. Um, but all of that work is equally important. I thought that was really nice, given the fact that you know, right now at our high school, we have lots and lots of people, actually all of our schools, doing a lot of the multicultural education and uh, some of those social justice pieces, right? So really that third tier for us will be culturally responsive education. 
she talked a lot about recognizing the dominant narrative, and I know you probably can't read that that well from here, uh, but she talked a lot about how the dominant culture is usually invisible to those people who inhabit the dominant culture. Uh, but that kind of got me to thinking about how the majority of our teaching force is white and female. And, you know, what things that she said to us about that is that means that people who are white and female and in places of power really need to start thinking about how they can, you know, control the education that's happening in our schools and become very aware of that dominant narrative. Um, she, you know, she had talked about how that's more important really than thinking about bringing in sort of cultural others to teach because this action can happen right now mm -hmm. and that action will happen over time. Right. And then finally that notion of reframe, reframing deficit thinking. And I think that we do that all the time and we do it really unconsciously. We you know, we'll think about you know, saying things like, oh, I don't think those kids are ready for that, my kids can't do that, it's not developmentally appropriate. There's sort of a whole litany of things that, that we use, but a lot of those comments really are deficit-oriented, and I think we have to become very conscious of what it is that we're doing every time we say that. So, well, I don't, can you say it again? What do you mean, by de what, what do you mean when you say it's deficit-oriented? <coughs> like the deficit, the we're deficit thinking the student has a deficit, or we're... Well, it's sort of deficit thinking. That, yeah, that you sort of think that a kid is not able to do something that maybe that child really is able to do. You're projecting a deficit. You're yes. assuming one exists. We're, exactly. Okay, I guess. Yes. Thank you. And that last bullet, where, you know, notice and name the deficit-oriented comments that reinforce negative views of certain student groups or certain families. Um, and then this slide is one that I will be, and it sort of does re relate to the goals in the sense of, you know, how does that play into the budget that we have built and the students who are coming into our district. And I will be revealing this slide again on the floor of town meeting. Uh, just so you can sort of see an update about where we are on 417, I filled in another column so that you can see the numbers that are there. Uh, the high school has stayed the same, the middle school is up six, the uh, elementary schools combined are up 24, uh, the preschool is up 10, our out-of-district placements have come down, and our vocational school attendees have remained the same. So of the 103 kids that we anticipated would be coming into our schools, and we did that anticipatory piece sort of in January, right, when we were creating this budget, of all of those students, 37 of those kids are already sitting in our classrooms. They are here, they're enrolled, they're being taught. Uh, so, you know, doing the math, you can see that we're 66 students away from that target. Um, but what has happened is when a family knows that they're moving into Hopkinton, they can go into power school and start the uh, registration process. And, well, if I had my next slide, which I, I don't have, but I will for town meeting, uh, right now you can see that we have about uh, 32 kids who have already started that process. In reality, 35 have, but this hasn't been updated for a couple of days. So, so we've gotten three more just but recently. So really, our wiggle room right now is somewhere around 30 students. And you, we know from past history how many kids have enrolled in our schools over the summer in the last couple of years. I think believing that only 30 kids are going to move into this district is, you know, absolutely misguided thinking. So. Especially if we had over 100. Last I mean, summer. Last summer. Right. Yeah. I hate to ask this, but do we know yet of the 20 some odd, whatever the elementary is, 20 some odds, where they landed? Uh, they didn't all land in like fifth grade or anything, did they? No. There were some already uh, tight questions. No. If I tight. had sent this in just a little bit later today, uh, we would have those numbers in this presentation. Uh, grade one has five, grade two has five, grade three has three, grade four has six, grade five has one, grade six has three, grade seven, two none in the eighth grade, seven in the ninth grade, one in the tenth grade, one in the eleventh grade, so none in the twelfth grade. That's not a Thanks. bad... No, yeah, uh, it's just a pretty good so, distribution right now. That's the curious bad. thing about that eighth grade, that was the only grade, because it would be this year's current seventh grade, correct? Is that the way... That, yes, yes, that's so it. So that was the only group that did not grow last year. Last year. Yes. Hmm. Interesting. Right, actually. So our numbers are approaching Westboro's numbers, aren't they? They are, yes. Yeah. We're right there. Yeah. And how much do they spend per pupil? I know you, you've given us that 
data before. I'd have to look to see what theirs is. Ours is 14557, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. theirs is more. And have they released yeah. yet the more recent? As of last Friday, the next mm -hmm. round of per pupil expenditures had not been released. Okay. I'm okay. kind of hoping that they will be before our town meeting right. so that we can see if it has, in fact, gone down. Mm -hmm. It would be very disappointing if the number went down. Yeah. Wow. We're getting crowded. I feel we like we should crazy. start this at the beginning of the meeting and then bring in all those positive uh, recognitions we have. Yes. It's like a downer, right? Yeah. But everyone at home is asleep by now. So. <laughs> I, well, I don't know what we can do to increase our viewership. <laughs> Leave a couple of I have some thoughts. <laughs> I'll keep them to myself. Um, it, it's not even May yet. Yeah. Yes. That is, it, that is concerning, all kidding aside, that just yes. where we're at. Yes. yes. Right. Drastic. Well, thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Is that, do you have more? I didn't want to cut you off. No. That, okay. That's it. That's, thank you. That's more than enough. Mm -hmm. That is more. Yep, we're good. Yep. <laughs> yes, thanks, we're full. <laughs> <laughs> so that brings us into the school committee chair report. And I have approved the payroll warrant S19021. And the payroll warrant has been included in your packet. I have also approved the accounts payable warrants 19-088. 19-089 and 19-090. The warrants have also been included in your packet. So the school committee office hours, I think I sent out the email about Mina was able to secure a time at the Senior Center on next Thursday, May 2nd from 9.30 to 11.30 in the morning. Uh, you know, I don't want to put you all on the spot, but if you would like to take time to be there for some of that, we can break it up in shifts as we've done before. I think it's a great opportunity uh, to be at the Senior Center right before we go with our budget presentation at town meeting because I think a lot of folks at the Senior Center will have questions that they would like answered about our budget. It gives us that opportunity to not just go out and have goodwill in the community, but to be really useful to people who are mm -hmm. concerned, confused, or excited about our budget or any combination thereof. So there's that. Then I also had uh, a couple of other things. It was a busy... Uh, time for the last couple of weeks as we are approaching town meeting. Uh, the stabilization fund uh, went through the Board of Selectmen as the, it, the document that it's also available on the town website, but the one that we all have seen uh, that has been going around along with the motions. Uh, so that will go on town meeting floor and we will, I think, probably want to get some education out there to people around that just because it's, I think, probably a new concept to people who haven't been following as closely. The Legacy Farms North bus situation on that road has come up a couple of times. Uh, so just what I'm, I'm, you know, working together with the town to look and see if there's going to be the opportunity to have a meeting with the builder uh, and that there would be an invitation extended to the schools to sit and, and to hear and kind of be part of that meeting. So that's, that's where that is right now. I don't have a date on that okay. right now. The Visions training, uh, which is the inclusion and diversity training that we had talked about a few weeks ago, I, had, uh, I don't need the dates right now, but the one week that we had been looking at was the week of July 22nd. If that's not good, and I know that does not work as well for you, if it might be easy if we could just, if you send me your dates that definitely won't work, like if you know you're going to be on vacation, and we could try to avoid around that. So it's exciting, though. It's really rich stuff that we're going to talk about, talking about um, historically included and excluded groups, talking about things that would inform policies that we're doing, uh, what it's like when you're treated as less than, mm -hmm. um, really a number of units. We did, I think, very well. It w it'll be a day over the summer training for seven hours. We'll have lunch together with the Youth Commission and with, I think Colleen Souza is going to go. I'm not sure if the new Youth, um, Sur youth and Family Services Director is going to be there as well. And then there will be a, a couple of hours follow-up probably in September or October just to kind of finish up the units on that. So that, that I'm excited about. Uh, so that's all I have for the school committee chair report. Uh, do people have liaison reports that they would like to do? I have one. Excellent. Um, at the planning board on Monday, um, the um, citizens' petition, I think it – for a moratorium on growth in the, in the town is in some limbo. Um, but what they did suggest and present to the, um, the planning board is a growth study committee. Um, and they were sort of working through what the charter of that committee might be, but it's 
essentially to research the impact of growth in the town and try to develop a more proactive plan to address that growth. Um, so that was a, a good, interesting discussion. It was pretty much um, Deb and Amy that were um, spearheading the effort. And so um, they're looking to, to figure out who they want to, how big of a committee they'd like to, to have and how, um, who they want to populate that committee. Um, so they, they sort of had a pretty diverse set of ideas, but the school committee was on pretty much everybody's idea list. Um, you know, school, police, fire, um, and then there were some other thoughts about Chamber of Commerce or Conservation Committee, you know, Open Space Committee, Historic District. That kind of folks were sort of all, all across the board on that, but definitely school, police, fire was on that list. So um, that is a work in progress, but I think that that's, you know, when um, Amy and Deb brought that citizen's petition, I think it at least sparked finally some action into, you know, like, let's take a real look at what's happening with all of these new homes that are being constructed and, you know, the, the sort of tr tricky situation it puts all of the public services in. So th that's that's good. Um, and even if the petition is, is not necessarily brought forward or um, whatever happens with the petition, I think that the, the formation of the committee and getting some information out there and maybe saying, look, we got to be more mindful of how much how much new development we authorize in our town, but thinking about social right. services or public services rather. So um, anyway, that was good. So Jim, was DPW on that list? Uh, it was on some people's list. Like water and sewer. Yep. You know, DPW was service. on that list, yep. Um, I don't know if I already said Chamber of Commerce. They were on that list. Um, so, you know, to try to balance off sort of the effects versus the financial impact on the town of, of minimizing development. So anyway, I, there's no, there wasn't any final sort of decision made, but it, it's a good, definitely a good thought. There was lots of other things going on, but they didn't seem to directly affect the schools as much as that one. So we'll go with that. All right. Should I? Chair? Yeah. So Mina and I met with Patricia Duarte. Is that how I pronounce her last name, or is it Duarte? I thought it was Duarte, Duarte but I'm not 100%, so All right. I don't want I'm to. not yet. Well, I've already embarrassed myself publicly about that, so well, one of Duarte. Us has. Um, because she's done some diversity awareness training with the town. And it's, you know, I love what the school is doing with diversity, and a lot of people have it on their mind that we need to raise consciousness. But I know myself as a slow learner that I need as much teaching as I can possibly get. So I like visions. I want the visions training, but I also would love to learn something from Patricia. She taught me a thing or two in our hour-long conversation and mortified me about the language I've been using. She didn't intend to mortify me. I felt self-mortification. Is that even a word? I don't know. So um, Mina wanted us to form a subcommittee on diversity um, as part of the school committee, not in contrast to what's going on, but as a complement to, just so we can pursue further research. When I want to find out about something, say a, a play by Shakespeare, I don't just read Harold Bloom on Shakespeare. I read a variety of critics. Same thing with diversity and consciousness raising. I want to hear what Visions has to say. I want to hear what Dr. Kavanaugh is bringing to the board. And I'd also like to poke around and find some things out myself. Great. So I think Mina would like us to ask permission to form a subcommittee. So I think we need to put that on, post that on the agenda before we take okay. action on it. I think right. that's certainly something we can put on um, our agenda. Thankfully, we get to meet again next week. So oh, if joy. there is space on, uh, I can talk with Mina in terms of where it makes sense to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a sort of procedural question. If, if one wanted to suggest a subcommittee, like Mina does, would she draft a, um, a proposed charter, like if a mission statement or whatever it is that we have to do for? So, yes. So I, it, before we approve it, we should have it, the scope Scope. Oh, and what, what, what exactly the, the goals of it are, kind of when we know yeah. what the completion, expected completion, like for example, with the website, the yeah. completion would be presumably when the website's <laughs> up, and, up and running, because I know that's been a lot of which, soon. soon. Uh, but to give in, like when we did the bridge, yeah. to have the real, the actual goals of it and the actual what kind of the scope. And suggested membership. I think. And suggested membership. I just membership. say this because I, I learned a lot in the website subcommittee creation. Yes. 
Sure. So it, yeah, it's a it's a you, great exercise. Like, I think come to you. And ask yeah. For tips. That's what I'll do. Great exercise in open meeting law. Great <laughs> exercise. Yes. So in in the number of people where we want to draw people from. Okay. So that that um, can kind of be figured out offline, and if it's ready to be put in the packet, because I'm realizing we need the packet to go up probably in the next day or so. So we could also put it off to the 16th. Yes. I don't want to rush, because yeah, I, no I think it's an important thing. I think we want to think about it carefully. Yeah, so I just wanted to introduce sense. the notion. Yeah, that that's we'll, great. We'll talk further about the great. details. Yeah. You know, um, and Mina and I had a discussion um, about, so she and Jim Cousins have really built an empire with that community communications mm. group. Yeah. We, I mean, she now has quite a few attendees, and they come from sort of all different walks of Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. um, and I had said to her that would be a very good group to tap into as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. because you'll really reach to right. you know, people who are coming from a variety of places. Right. You know, anything yeah. from, you know, neighborhoods to the garden club to HCAM, you know, the library. Yeah. People come from a senior center everywhere. Mm. Great. It's a good group. That's it. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, my standard website's chugging along. <laughs> um, the, More than chugging along. You guys have done a tremendous amount of work. Uh, not me. It's Ashok and his team. Lots, lots, lots of time. Lots of quick turnarounds with the vendor and um, a lot of hours. And the team has been incredibly responsive and turning around um, comments to the designers and so forth over the weekends and over vacation. And they've gone kind of above and beyond. We were hoping to have the quote-unquote final design approved today. We as a subcommittee met this morning and we all agree that it, we're not there yet. Um, we didn't, we're close. Um, we're balancing, as I think I mentioned to somebody, we're balancing functionality um, with priorities on access to calendaring and events, which were the community's top priorities. Easy, easy at a glance knowing what's going on, where my child needs to be, et cetera with visual interest. Mm -hmm. And that's, so we're just making sure that we have a cohesive visual design, but it's also very functional. And that's what we're tweaking. So hopefully um, in the very near future, we'll have the homepage and the style guide finalized and we'll bring it to share. And then they'll work on the school level pages and um, tweaking the mobile, the mobile design to make sure that Things are stacking and wrapping and so forth on a phone and on a tablet and whatnot the way we need them to. So, chugging along. Fantastic. And I should say on the side, they're also doing a lot of work on content. Um, uh, rele relevant to us is the policy content, which they have converted most of our policies to HTML, which will help with translation and um, searchability. Great. So um, they've already done that. They've got a staging area for new content for the new website, and um, they've been working very hard on that. So I think it's going to look really nice. And it should make our policy manual much more accessible to everybody, us included. That's great. Yeah. But, I like us included, well too. Us included, yeah. It, well, it can be difficult to find just the right policy um, yes. if you don't understand particularly the way the letters go. And right, yeah. exactly. Great, thank you. I have a couple. Uh, Mina and I, uh, in, in, I just am feeling the missing of Mina today, um, but she and I did meet and had a really good conversation on the processes stuff so that we will be able to bring something forward to show and kind of to map out our work kind of, it's, we're not doing a one-off, we're looking to kind of keep this work going. So that's, nice. that was that. Uh, next week I am going to bring forward a report on the turf field uh, funding. I, if you recall back when we met with appropriations there was and ask on that and some ideas on, and to update where we are and kind of ideas on where we're going forward with that. Okay. So that's, I will have that. Um, the bridge is gaining some steam uh, and really excited about the enthusiasm that the people individually bring to the committee. Uh, and it's really, it's eye-opening to me when the needs that are being identified within the district. So in looking to try to meet things like, you know, making sure that they're able to, students are able to come prepared that have materials, binders, things like that, that they are not always able to purchase for themselves. Mm -hmm. So really concrete things like that, but also things uh, like we're looking at putting out a survey. I know I hate survey, it feels like a dirty word here. Uh, <laughs> but a, to survey what some of the needs are that students are having that they're not able to, and what the barriers are for them to access needs. For example, uh, field trips are a big deal in multiple bu buildings where kids are having difficulty or where they're not bringing in money for field trips and the school's not always sure because they're not always reaching out.
to say they have a financial need and what the barriers are of why people don't reach out when they have a need. So that's trying to get at some of that information. So um, doing that and kind of moving forward with that. So and then that's great. yeah, so that those were my only actual subcommittee things. But I am really excited for the bridge to in particularly be as we're closing out this year what we can learn to inform the opening of school in September when there are you know all fresh faces I'm curious so um, the bridge I know in some communities mm -hmm. that have families that struggle with yeah. some of the financial demands right. that we all face um, they they get concerned about nutrition in the summer has that been brought up in the bridge committee at all because uh, when, when students yeah. don't have access to to food at school do we have any concerns in our community so, that we know of? So I am not familiar with those statistics. I think probably uh, Colleen Souza and the okay. youth, the youth commission would have more statistics on that, just because they're okay. really dealing more hands-on with what the needs are in the community okay. uh, on a larger basis. Okay. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where we are with. With that, and I will have more. Um, that will be more uh, coming as because we are going to start to have more fruits of our labor. I guess yeah. would be the, the thing there. So that moves us into um, new business. So we have uh, item A, which is the Boston Athletic Association donation. Okay, so the uh, Boston Athletic Association um, has donated twenty-five thousand dollars to the Hopkins Public Schools gift account, and I am just looking for a motion to. Um, accept that donation. I move to accept it. Excellent. Motion by Meg. Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. So, that, so moved. And with thanks to the um, Boston Athletic Association. Yes. yes. And That's I spoke nice. to Mr. Kildeff today, and he will be coming to a subsequent meeting because he has more money for us. Oh. And he'll be bringing oh. his BAA friends with him. I love oh. when he comes sure, to our I, meetings. Yes, I know. <laughs> And I know we always say he brings swag. He brings so. swag. Yes. <laughs> That's right. I still got a nice sense. Band. Okay. Yep. Uh, um, a request from Mr. Keller that um, on behalf of the middle school that we accept uh, 15 ThinkPad laptops with an estimated value of $1,500 and those were given to us from David Vidoni who is the Vice President of Informational Technology Pegasystems. So just look for a motion for that. I move that we accept the ThinkPad laptops. Motion by Meg. Is there a second? Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. And so. A special thank you to them for that as yes, well. Yes, that's fantastic. I like how you bring all these positive things and pick us up in the meeting in the middle. <laughs> it keeps us going. When I read this agenda, I was like, this is going to be great, this little section right here. This is going to be really fantastic. Yeah. Chip yeah. yeah. It's just great. They're yeah. so generous. And we have three $100 donations, and I am looking for a motion to accept those donations from um, Gerard Lazaro, um, Hopkinton Spoon, Inc., um, and hop from Gerard Lazaro, Hopkins and Spoon, Inc., and Bill's Pizza. So three $100 donations in totaling $300 to be given to the Hopkins and Middle School Robotics Club. I move to accept those donations. Motion by Meg. Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. So that's so moved. We're very lucky to have such a generous community. We yeah. really are. We have yes, a lot of are. support from the businesses yeah. of town. And the last one is a um, $100 donation from Janet Harris for the Middle School Desire to Inspire program. I move to accept that donation, too. Motion by Meg. Second. Second by Amanda. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And that is also passes. Thank you, everybody. It's so fantastic. that brings us yes, then into you. the Upper Charles uh, Trail presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. It's all set. Yeah. Okay, and thank you. Jane, I can just advance those slides as you tell me to. Sure. Because they're already loaded. All right. Let me get my laptop up here. Get my <laughs> so, um, my name is Jane Moran, and I'm the chairman of the Upper Charles Trail Committee. And we have. Um, and I'm very grateful for you guys seeing me tonight. I think that uh, this is such an integral part of our <coughs> vision that, and we have been working on this for quite a while, um, and I'll mention it in my presentation, but this is just another step in the process. 
So it, it we feel that it's necessary for our, you'll, it will be obvious why we need to bring you up to speed. <laughs> so um, some of you may or may not be aware of the Milford and <coughs> Charles Trail. So this, um, the, our committee has been charged by the Hopkinton Board of Selectmen probably about six years ago now to plan, construct, build, and engineer a similar trail. It's called the Asphalt <coughs> Trail that would provide connectivity from the Milford town line to the Ashland town line. So the trail would start at the Milford Trail. It would cross Hayden Row several times and arrive at the <coughs> Marathon School. And I'll explain more about that later. It has been suggested by our um, engineers to con connect from the, Mil uh, the Marathon School through the EMC Park, through the school complex, to the Center Trail proceeding to the Main Street Corridor, to the downtown common, where it would continue east through town-owned property, crossing Route 135 in the vicinity of the Legacy Farms area. It would continue north, ultimately ending up in the Hopkinton State Park in the town of Ashland, actually. So over the past five years, we've hired various uh, engineering firms to connect pre-visibility studies to show us where the trail could be built. <clears throat> they have presented multiple options and each of the options provides their own set of challenges. At this point, the point of the focus of the Upper Charles Trail is to provide connectivity from the Marathon School to the Center Trail. So that's why I'm here tonight. We feel, the Upper Charles Trails feels very strongly that if, even if we can't build this complete seven-mile trail from Milford to Ashland, we feel that this particular connectivity is really important and vitally integral. And, you know, it's, it's a huge thing, a huge opportunity for the town of Hopkinton to take advantage of. So recently we, are import, we were informed of an opportunity that we could apply for a mass trails grant that would pay for the full engineering studies. That's just a mass trails um, grant. The committee could then use the, um, what we would gain, the, you know, the feasibility studies and the engineering studies, and then we could actually apply for a mass tips grant. The mass tips grant would um, pay for the actual construction of this connect connective trail from Hayden Row through the school complex to the center trail and we estimate that cost value to be 1.6 million so there's a lot of money here on the table so our opportunity for connectivity is that the first step is the mass trails grant so this, if we were fortunate enough to get this mass trails grant, we estimate that the value of that would be between 40 and 60 K, just to provide the engineering studies and the design and the engineering, and all, the scope of work and all of that. We would then take that information and use it because that's part of the necessary requirements to apply for a mass tips grant. You have to pay for that. The town would have to pay for that. So we're looking for this kind of freebie here if we could go for the Mass Tips Grant. And as I mentioned before, the estimate approximate value of actually building this trail would be about 1.6. We've already received that information from our engineering firms. So in order to apply for either grant, we need the permission from the school committee to go forward because all of the proper property owners have to sign off on this and we're involved with probably 10 or 11 different property owners and various stakeholders, town, various committees and boards that um, we need to, you know, sell this project to in order to go forward, in order to apply for the Mass Tips <coughs> grant. So this is another step in our process. <laughs> So I'm here tonight to seek a permission and a favorable vote, hopefully, from the school committee to diverse through the school, school property to the ultimate purpose of building this trail. So what does this trail look like? 
So that yeah. would be the next slide. Okay, so I'm not sure. I might get up there and show you. <coughs> so the trail would come through, this is the EMC Park here, mm -hmm. and this would be the project limit. It would come down Tomino property, uh, which is just south of, uh, yeah, south of McDermott Town, enter the Tomino property here. And you see these little crisscrosses here? That's the abandoned railroad bed. So we would use this territory to reclaim and repurpose the abandoned railroad bed. And the end of the scope of the project is connecting to the existing center trail, which is here. So for the purposes of um, identification, this is the high school complex here. This is the elementary school here. We would come here, we would have to cross the loop road two times. So this is about 2,000 feet north of the elementary school. Then we would enter the wooded road, wooded um, land again, <coughs> where we would need to cross the center trail again, I mean the, the uh, loop road again, to connect to the center trail. There is a second slide that I provided which shows the uh, engineering legends, which shows wetlands and things like that, but does not show the high school complex. So before I open it up to questions, I would just like to give you a little bit of a background. Many years ago when the um, Marathon School was in the planning stage and there was negotiations and whatever you want to call it between the planning board and the um, school committee uh, with the school committee, planning, whatever they were called. Um, and we, the Upper Charles Trail was there just about every meeting because we had a vision that we wanted to circumvent the borders of the Irvine Tadara property so that we could connect to EMC Park to ultimately get to this point where we could enter the school uh, complex and connect to the center, square, center trail. The challenge that the Upper Charles Trail has is that in the Board of Selectmen, when they charged us with our purpose, we have to include the center trail in our project because that's part of the original abandoned railroad bed. So how do we get from the Milford Bike Trail to the center trail? And I have to tell you that this was, um, this was, this, plan is our first choice, but there is another choice. And the other choice was to enter privately owned properties in back of the Charlesview area, but there were over five different property owners that we would have to come to agreements with. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, right, right off, first off the bat, we ran into a huge stone wall. And um, we would have to it's, it's not that it couldn't happen, but it may not happen for a long, long time. Um, the, there was, um, there's already been a solar farm built there. There's already been um, another development that was not agreeable to us. We, we've been working really diligently to get there. Um, a couple of property owners just hung up on us and said, don't come near me, we don't want to talk to you. So we have had our challenges, but, and, but that's okay because to be truthful with you, we always felt that this was our desired effect, but this plan has to be approved ultimately by the Board of Selectmen, and the Board of Selectmen um, have made it clear to us that we have to exhaust any and all um, avenues. So we really um, needed to pursue all of those avenues. So this is where we are today. If this doesn't work out, we'll go back to another plan. But anyway, at the end of the day, with the Irvine Tadara property and the Marathon School, we did get permission. So we already have that existing easement around that Irvine Tadara property that will connect to the EMC property. Um, the second um, thing that I would like to mention is that uh, we have worked um, diligently, not only with um, this particular aspect, but um, other multiple partners throughout the area. And this is, 
this is where we are now. Uh, and this is just one more step in the process um, to gaining our ultimate goal, which is a ways down the road. And I just want to remind you, we're still in the planning process. So we're at the 20,000 foot level. So I can share with you some of the facts that can go forward in the next step, but I may not be able to answer everything, but I will do the best I can. So I open it up to questions. <laughs> so what is your hoped for timeline kind of with the next steps moving forward? Well, actually, it's interesting that you should mention that because we are ready with our engineering firm to go forward at any point in time because we just had our uh, proposal that, we, um, that approved by um, the town to uh, spend our budgeted money. We had money budgeted for this, but we had to get the engineering firm to propose it. And this language would provide the engineering firm the opportunity to enter the school property and do wetlands observations, soil testing, and things like that. Uh, we are ready to do that any time if we get the permission to go forward. You got any other questions? I have a couple. I mean, I, I love the, the trail. I just want to make sure that, you know, does I just have a couple questions. Sure. Um, I guess, let me skip the first one and go to the second one. Um, the cross-country trail that was built recently, this, a year ago? Was it two years ago? A year ago? Last year was the Last first year. year it was There's open. been a couple. Will it have any, will the construction of this have any impact whatsoever on the cross-country trail? No. It's not anywhere near it. Um, Doesn't the cross country trail intersect with down. center school? It, it I mean, center, center trail. trail. It, yeah, they center do trail. Use it does center. not go near the abandoned rail bed. It goes down the center trail, though. Oh, but that's already yeah. been approved. That's right. mandated by the Board of Selectmen. That will be the Upper Charles Trail. It doesn't need to be altered. But it does not have to, it will not interfere with. But, but I mean, the construction piece. I know I, what's already oh, there no. is there, but the construction piece won't affect what the cross country. What we heard from the state is that we have already several patches that um, have been mandated for, for example, the center trail. We will get credit for that, but they will not interfere with us um, in coming in and mandating uh, asphalt or anything else. They will just give us credits for a, pe a, partial, a partial piece of the trail already being built. Okay, as dirt, and it can stay dirt, or does it it's, have to be paved? Um, well, when we go forward and propose our ultimate plan, we will get the most points and the most money from the state if we have it paved. Okay. It, but we do not get discredit for, if that's such a word, we won't get penalized <laughs> for having existing partial um, stone dust trails okay. existing. As long as they comply with handicapped accessibility and things like that. It could be that we need to apply for improvements okay. and they would want that so that was sort of that was that ties into the first question i had on my list so the existing trails that are already in the place where the new trail is going to be constructed so i understand center trail and, and you know i'm familiar with that but where you want to build the new section are there any trails already there kind of that are just not They're necessarily only, efficient uh, we would classify them as class one or class two trails you could go in there and you could walk uh, maybe single person, one person behind the other, and maybe walk your dog, but you're going to trip over roots, mm -hmm. um, things like that. We would need to, in order to um, get our state grant, uh, uh, have the engineering studies done to upgrade it to a Class 5 trail, which is similar to the Milford Trail. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of maintenance of the trail, if it's on school grounds, how, how will that be handled? The you know. That's an interesting question, and I think that would probably have to be mitigated as we go down the road. However, it's my understanding now that if it's been built and regulated and sponsored by the Upper Charles Trail, either the Upper Charles Trail Friends Association would be responsible for it, or the town. Okay. And along with that, too, especially on school grounds, I guess security on the trails would be another thing that kind Correct. of goes hand in hand with maintenance. And so we're still at the 20,000. By the, of course, whatever. Right. So that as if we are fortunate enough to get these grants and then these engineering studies come in, and uh, a contract is awarded, those subjects would 
be brought up in public meetings, which are required uh, through these grant processes. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure those conversations would happen and people could converse with it. But I can tell you, if you look at the Milford um, Trail now and other, there are other similar types of trails. There's the Bourne Trail, there's you know, multiple trails throughout the state right. that have done this. And there are mitigation factors all along. It just depends on the individual needs and the necessities. Right. Which my last question might not be appropriate for the 20,000 foot view either, but um, <laughs> The other, the last piece, I mean, all of these, I'm just keep, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking the kids are going to use this. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, in terms of security, I want to make sure that the, you know, for the kids and, and the maintenance, the schools, you know, we, we got a tight situation right now anyway. We can't add that to our budget. Right. Um, but then the last piece to me is, is sort of the construction piece. How would we ensure that the construction does not affect the kids, you know, I mean, the timeline of the sure. construction would have to be the school's 10 months out of the year. Is that little two-month window in the summertime going to be sufficient in order to complete the construction so it doesn't affect? I can't answer that right now. Right. But I would suggest that a little bit I know about grants and awarding of contracts, that that would be up to the various partners to have those regulations written into the agreement with the construction companies so that everybody is comfortable. And as far as um, providing opportunities for kids, you're right. That we're, it is our hope, and that's why we envisioned this, that we could draw the community together and right. we could pull neighborhoods together. But not only that, I think that you guys are in an infinite position to provide multiple areas of um, opportunities for all diversities. I visited one trail where there was actually a a segment for a braille system for blind kids to use it and where it's going to be asphalted you're close enough to the handicap areas it would you know you can have uh, kids with wheelchairs and accessibilities use it and just getting from one school site to the other or having different activities you know you have all your programs in the evenings and and in the summer and having an opportunity for neighborhoods to enjoy the trail and walk to the site rather than driving to the site right so I think, uh, you know, we're going to have concerns all along the way. And I think that um, from what I've discovered, uh, talking with all of the partners, I would say 80% of them are really, really excited about finding a way to work this out. Right now I'm in serious negotiations with Legacy Farms, Pulte, Heritage Farm, and Tennessee Gas. And we want to make this happen. Yeah. Right. It's exciting. It is. It's, it's very exciting. So we're going right. through multiple, you know, mitigations and, you know, counter proposals and things like that. But I think all of us are determined to try and make this happen. I, I really admire your perseverance and the perseverance of the Upper Charles Trail mm -hmm. Committee because I know oh, thank you. <laughs> you have encountered unbelievable obstacles. Mm -hmm. When this trail to me seems an environmental imperative, why we don't focus more on creating trails that kids can bike or walk mm -hmm. to school when we have such traffic problems, we have pollution problems. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we thinking like this more has always astonished me. So I, I think it's a fabulous idea. I also think making the trails more accessible to people in wheelchairs or mm -hmm. with different disabilities and that includes paving central trail is absolutely important. Yeah. And because that will be a conversation is, for the public to discuss uh, later on. Exactly, but yeah. it's making it it's, accessible to yes. everyone. Yeah. And I think yeah. great, good job. Good for you for staying the course. I know oh. it's not easy. <laughs> really. Well, we're also make trying to make it available for equestrian use and also oh, wow. you know, other a variety of opportunities oh for all kinds of people <laughs> throughout town <laughs> and um, especially in our legacy farms north we were yeah. able to get in in the uh, in the discussion early enough so that we were able to um, offer them an opportunity to provide a separate side-by-side -side trail right. for mm -hmm. equestrian users it's not appropriate for the whole trail sure. but um, that would get people from a certain point in the east part of Hopkinton over to Hopkinton State Park, which is one of the few parks mm -hmm. that allows equestrian use. So, 
I mean, Thank it's you. multiple, yeah. multiple opportunities that we've just started to scratch the surface on. I think this is just beginning. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, can, can I just ask, I'm not great at reading a map and I can't see very well, so <laughs> there's two bad things. Um, I can certainly email this to you folks. Okay, the, the cut through um, old rail bed that's the yes. dotted red line, is that currently the path that the kids use to get to Kayla? Parts of it. I can't tell you that all of it is uh, that they use, but they do use parts of it. Okay, it looks they like... used to get where? To Kayla, to j and Kayla. That Hopkins is the one that's... But you said elementary school. You meant that's Hopkins there, right? Closer. Hopkins is okay. So this is the yes. That's Hopkins. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that that horizontal red dotted line. Yeah. No, not no, no. Yep. Yeah, there we go. From that circle across the wetland. Yes. To the left. Right here. I think this is where they're cutting through here. And then they to go. Get to this area. Now, no. There's also opportunity to tell you to improve the cut through. There's multiple smaller trails here, and that would be up to the school committee if they wanted to take advantage of that. And I can also tell you that this ultimate um, picture, if it does get through, we have an opportunity in the very beginning to do spur connections. So that's something we could talk about later, so that if, the, if we find that these kids are coming through, and I think they are coming through from the high school to get to different parts, and I'm not I think what they do actually is what I'm trying to figure out. I think they do walk to where that red circle is, and yeah. I think they cut, they go left. Yeah. Okay. And they cut through, because I think K lot, if I'm reading the map right, is, is that right? To, is to the far left? Yeah, it's up there. Right. It's the existing center. Oh, so it's even, it's way over there. Yeah. K lot. K -Lot's, it's a walk. It's back in the curtain there somewhere. Yeah, so it, it's kind of irrelevant, but if we get on board early, there's an option for us to include some spur trails in Isle. So we also have a wonderful, a volunteer in town, Peter Legoy, who really relishes in um, cr designing smaller type spur trails. He's not really interested in what we're doing with the class five paved, mm -hmm. but he's more interested in the running trial, running trails, connectivity trails. So we have unlimited resources in this town. We're very, very fortunate. So just to finish, so I just what I'm curious about is I, I love the Milford Trail. I love the trails. So I'm, okay. I'm hoping that somehow we can figure this out. But um, with the connection to, to Marathon and going through the schools, we'll have a lot of students walking on these trails at certain times of day because they do use that to access their parking lots. Yes. So the student drivers are going through there. The elementary schools or young families may be walking. Um, I know like on the Cape, when the, you know, there are a lot of rail trails on the Cape, and sometimes you know the cyclists are training and the walkers are, you know, kind of, mm -hmm. they're meandering. And sometimes a, a training cyclist and a meandering young child can be very dangerous. So will there, is there anticip an anticipation of sort of um, road, like d d a divided area or a separate yes. part for bikes or particularly on school property, an area for pedestrians or... or mm -hmm. That's sort of safe. So this trail would be cyclist. 12 feet wide, divided with um, painted lines. Okay. And, um, you know, various multiple safety features throughout the whole planned course. I do know that if these cyclists in a planned event have to get permission from the Hopkinton Police Department to get a permit to go through mm -hmm. their town. And okay. I, would, I would imagine that that would include the school property as well, because this would be town property. So that is something that would need to be addressed further on down the road so that we can plan events and maybe let people know it's not a good time to go out on the trail if they're there or warn cyclists. Because I know that that is a problem down in the Cape area. It can, when it they can have be races yeah, yeah. and the residents haven't been warned that this is not a good day to be out there. So it's just, it's about a, a information and education and planning. And how long is the stretch from Marathon to Center Trail? It's about a about a half a mile. Okay. So, question over here: Has Mr. Person had an opportunity to 
considering no. this? So I think that's why we put it on the agenda tonight for just a report. I thought it might be prudent for each of you to walk it and yes. for us to run this by Tim and his department. So Tim and I actually met um, oh. Oh, over a year ago. Yeah, that's okay. right. So, oh, we, that's so we've been through this. Okay. Okay. And uh, I believe Peter Lagoy was with us at the time and possibly even Mike Tim, uh, Mike Bolson. Okay. So we've seen this. Okay. So if that's the case, I would like to schedule an opportunity for us to do a site walk. And mm -hmm. then because we can't really vote on it because it's not up for vote anyway on our agenda. Yeah. Uh, and then schedule a vote on this for an upcoming meeting. So does that mm -hmm. make sense? I would, and I'd love to see the map closer up. Right? Yes. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, that would if, and, but would people be interested in taking a site walk? I'd love a site walk. Yeah. I do it every day, so I'm happy then, to do uh, it with you. Fabulous. And can I ask Jane? I mean, I, I mean, same thing. I, I would love to make this happen. Um, it's just from the, you know, the school standpoint that I feel like it, there's some potential sticky things. You know, if it weren't school land, if it were town land, it'd be like, be like awesome. Um, if if we do, if we go forward with this and then some of these concerns that we've brought up are you know we we hit some sort of roadblock how, what happens then so part of the approval process of, a, of this um, approving the um, this first step the um, mass trails grant is that within the grant there has to be two or three different I think it's two public meetings that we are responsible for having I think those questions would come up then about the public. Okay. I can tell you, so I don't know what the sticky points might be, but you sure. would definitely hear, hear about them then. Right. Okay, so okay. we possibly hear about these sticky points, and maybe you want to go forward with it, or maybe you don't. Um, at this point, we've invested, I think, about uh, less than $10,000 to hire our engineering firm to go forward with the preliminary. So when I said they're ready to go, they could be go they could go out on your property tomorrow to do this uh, very minor site work and get this going so that they can continue to do their work. If if the, the next step for them would be to help us with the public hearings and to help us come before the planning board and the most important part is the conservation commission because there is a lot of wetlands in there. Mm -hmm. So the, what our committee has instructed them to do is make us ready, conservation commission ready. If we can't do this, we want to know now. We right. don't want to waste anybody's time. Sure. Uh, but there should be a way. I mean, they build bridges over oceans, for crying out loud, <laughs> and rivers. Yep. Um, so we just don't know what that's going to entail. Mm -hmm. That cost would be reflected in the secondary uh, grant, which would be the mass tip. So if we have to build a bridge or if we have to build a boardwalk, that cost would then be reflected. But we don't know that mm -hmm. until they do that. Okay. But to address your point, our approval could be contingent on some of the, if there were concerns that we identified. Correct. Right, right. So if we lose it in the end of the game, uh, the town has lost $10,000 if, mm -hmm. if the school committee doesn't agree to the final. Because this is all contingent upon further public hearings and don't forget the Board of Selectmen has to find, sign off on the entire project at the end of the day. Right. So you guys are first. <laughs> we feel special. Board of Selectmen <laughs> have to sign off on it at the end of the day. So, sorry, just at the two points where you're crossing <clears throat> the loop road, yes. would there be like a push button signal that would stop oh, traffic sure. or not? I mean just because mm. as you probably well aware, I would twi imagine. twice, four, actually four times a day because we're two different school schedules right now. It's a bus route. So it's what a they do route. is they go out there with traffic survey, and they do um, the traffic surveys, and they figure out what the times are, that there's the most traffic, and what the most of what times generate the most time of day, and then from there the engineering companies figure out the best traffic signals that are available, and would be recommended. And again, that information would come before you. And you want to upgrade or you want to downgrade or you want to keep it as is. I mean, these are just all things that they're recommending as professionals. And you would have heard your constituents. You would have heard from the public meetings. You would have heard from, you know, maybe we need extra signage. Um, you know, whatever the, the interest may be, uh, there would be times to address those. 
this is just, as I mentioned, a very preliminary first step in the process to get us where we hope to be at the end of the day. But this is by no ways the end of the story. There's lots of conversation that needs to continue. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You so thank, much. You. Well, thank you for being open. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think we're, um, it's really, uh, we feel strongly that this is really important for our total community. Yeah. And I think our school kids are one of the biggest. I appreciate you're looking at the whole town and, and yeah. I, I hear a lot of kind of, it seems like growing conversations around town about one Hopkinton and cross collaboration mm -hmm. between groups and it really, it, it feels good to all yeah. come together on different issues like this. Well, that's how we're going to be successful. When yeah. you share this, um, did you have a picture? I know this is a phase of the whole thing. I love the <clears throat> idea of the connection to Milford. Do you have a picture that etches out where you go in, fa in the next phase, like how we're going to get to Milford? It's at this point, Ashton? it's um, it's not big because we feel like we can't really reveal uh, private own property owners okay. that we're negotiating with, but okay. we do have a very... Um, we do have a nice concept, and I'd be happy to forward that to Georgette um, or Dr. Sure. Kavanaugh tomorrow. And I did, I did forward this. Georgette has this, correct? Yes, so she, she has this. The committee. Okay. Yes, Perfect. so she could forward it to the committee, mm -hmm. and then I could forward you further documents as you proceed. And then we also have a website where all of our engineering studies are posted online. Oh, great. Okay. Yep, so you could just check um, Upper Charles Trail Committee, um, HopkintonMass.com. And it's also available on the Tom White Tom White website, okay. so that you just, that all of the visibility studies that we're uh, relying on our information from that are posted. That's awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, so you very much. much. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for all the do diligence in working with all the kids in town, especially my three grandchildren. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, hopefully um, you'll let me know when you want me to come back. Yes. Sure. Okay. Well. Great. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right. Have a good night, Jane. Thank you. Yeah. See, See you soon. See you soon. Do you have any idea when that might be? The engineering first. For uh, engineering for firm is anxious to know whether they can book another job or not, or if they would be um, allowed permission to go on the property to do some preliminary work. We have on the sixth and the sixteenth. The second and the sixteenth. We have two meetings, so we could try to put get that on sooner rather than later. We could hopefully try to get a site walk scheduled in the next between now and the next meeting. Is that? It's, unless it's raining every day between them. I know. But, yeah, uh, I mean, it's right there. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but to try to maybe bring it back on the 16th, does that does that work? May 16th? Oh, absolutely. I'm available. Okay. Super. Thank okay. you. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good Thanks. Thank you. You, you too. too. Thank you. Bye-bye. So that brings us into the next item, uh, which is the MOU with the Legacy Farms um, discussion. And as you will recall from now I'm trying to think of the date when we met, but when we, we met and discussed some of these things, we had talked about have, entering into an MOU with the Board of Selectmen regarding uh, the mitigation money with Legacy Farms. And I am happy to report I did had a very nice conversation with the Chair of the Board of Selectmen, Claire Wright, about this. It seems that her sense was that the Board of Selectmen would be very happy to enter into an MOU. And I know there are a couple of things that we have to consider in going forward, one of which is ultimately the mitigation money will be under the jurisdiction of town meeting um, and not our MOU, mm -hmm. uh, which is that it, it, town meeting can vote how town meeting can vote. Um, but the sense that we had in discussing it is that an MOU would still be a desirable thing to enter into because it will provide guidance for future iterations of both boards on what the intent was of the stabilization fund and also for the voters so that when different items come forward there is something to reflect back on and to say this is what when the stabilization account was created this is what the intent was these are the things that should be considered so I think it's a valid thing her one thing that she her and I 
point that she had is she her feeling was that it should happen after the election since there may be some turnover, um, maybe not turnover on different boards, uh, and that we should figure it out then because it would also it, we wouldn't have it done in time for town meeting anyway. Mm -hmm. Was sort of the and the couple of things that I think we want to keep in mind when we actually sit down to draft the MOU would be obviously the intended purposes that we see, and we did list some of those out uh, in a previous meeting in terms of mitigation and making sure that we can keep that focus going forward. And I think also we want to make sure that we call out specifically that the things that the mitigation money is covering are things that are outside of our operating budget, that it's not meant to be a substitute for our operating budget, that our operating budget is our operating budget and our operating costs, obviously. But the mitigation money is meant for mitigation and that we should be able to kind of do both. Yes. That's the update. Um, and I don't have, obviously, some, if we're going to wait until after the election. But that's, I don't know if anybody had any questions related to that um, or comments or thoughts on going forward. I always think we need to provide the translation of MOU. Yeah, that, actually, <laughs> thank you. That's an excellent memorandum of understanding. Thank you very it's, much. I, it, you know what? I think part of what happens to me is that we use them so much amongst ourselves and kind of in different ways that it, it kind of takes the place of the actual full name. So the reminder is appreciated. So just to clarify, when you say the mm -hmm. the funds would be outside of the operating budget, it means that the operating budget will cover operations Correct. for the year. And then if a um, growth triggered need arises during the year that's not was not built into the scope of the operating budget, that's when we would apply potentially th this money Correct. to address that need. Correct. And that that's, it wouldn't, for example, be kind of as we're building our budget to say we've requested, I don't know, X amount of money yeah. for, I, I don't know, with something, that we have, like textbooks, for example. Right. We needed money that it's not going to say, oh, well, we're, we're trying to cut costs out of the operating budget. Just take that for the mitigation money. Right. That that's not a true mitigation. Great. Thank you. It's good to clarify. So that's. And thank you and Dr. Kavanaugh for your perseverance these last few months. I, I think we are in a good place going into town meeting. Mm -hmm. so as, good, as good as it gets. That is that. And that uh, moves us into the superintendent evaluation process, which is, um, I just, I'm going to say this for the benefit of our audience, one of our three most important tasks that we do um, on our time on the school committee, obviously policy and budget being the other two. I included in the packet it, and I don't know, Amanda, if you were at this breakout from the MASC conference or not. I was. Okay. It, it, it kind of has become a blur because the fall seems yes. like a long time ago. <laughs> but because I thought it was a helpful um, thing to look at for us, it, it, I liked how, how simple it is to look at the, the process itself because I know when we did the formative evaluation, it felt like kind of a big ask in terms of we hadn't done this before and trying to make our way figure out the process, whereas this seems like the process is spelled out better. Uh, I think you had also... I did. So I had Georgette create these folders. So fancy. <laughs> one of them is for Mina, so I'll hang on to that one. Okay. Oh, excellent. And the presentation that Nancy was just describing is on the left, mm -hmm. but on the right-hand mm -hmm. side what you will find is what the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has put out is sort of the official form for superintendent evaluation. Now, the department doesn't say that you have to use this form, um, but I think that it's a form that sort of spells out the process very nicely, so it may be helpful for us to take a look at as a group. Um, what you see at the top is an assessment of the progress toward the superintendent's goals. So any of those goals that are professional practice, student learning, or district improvement. And the five categories there are did not meet, made some progress, made significant progress, met the goal, or exceeded the goal. And so you would take the five goals that were up on the screen tonight and you would evaluate them um, looking at you know, all five of those categories. And then step two is to assess the superintendent on the performance standards. And when we say performance standards, what we mean really by that is we always call it the evaluation rubric. And the four standards globally are instructional leadership, 
management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture. And then what would happen is there would be an overall summative performance rating. So based on the goals, based on the rubric, um, is the superintendent unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient, or exemplary? And then there's a rating impact on student learning. Would you say that um, the impact on student learning is low, moderate, or high? And then there's an opportunity for any evaluator comments. Uh, after you get past page <coughs> two, you can put in the, it's sort of the worksheet area, so you can put in the professional practice goal, the student learning goal, and any district improvement goals. Um, any additional goals, so say there were two student learning goals, for example, that would fall into category six and seven, or boxes six and seven. And that's sort of your little worksheet area right there. That first page is that, you know, just real summative part, and then you get into some more of the nitty gritty. And then you get into <coughs> what we would call the rubric, and I believe that, so if you look at 1A curriculum and 1B instruction, those are the sort of very global um, headlines that go with those. So there's 1A1, 1A2, and there are descriptors that go with each one of those. Um, and we call those elements. So what you're seeing there are the standards and the indicators only. And again, you would evaluate unsatisfactory needs improvement, proficient, or exemplary, and there are places there for commentary. And you can see that you do that with standards one, standard two, standard three, and standard four. And so that gets you to page seven. Now, I guess what um, some districts will do is they'll ask superintendents only to be evaluated on you know, one of those um, areas under each standard, two under each standard. Sometimes they'll be heavy in standard one and standard two, less heavy in standard three and standard four, however that plays out. But because for this year, now, we really took on this whole package. I, would, I think that it's sort of fair that we stay in that vein and we take a look at my evaluation through that whole package. So what I'm going to ask you to do between now and our next, well, actually now and next Tuesday, because we'll need some time between Tuesday and Thursday, is to just sort of take a look at all of this documentation. And I know that in some sense you may sort of have this gut feeling about the way things are going in a, in a particular place. So... If I can just maybe throw out an example. So, for example, on, you know, page four of seven, if you looked at 1E that says data-informed decision-making, the superintendent uses multiple sources of evidence related to student learning, including state, district, and school assessment results and growth data to inform school and district goals and improve organizational performance, educator effectiveness, and student learning. You may have sort of a gut feeling that that's going well, that's going not well. But if you have questions about any of these that you would like to talk to me about, have evidence put on the table for, I'm happy to do that. And I think I would prefer to you know, put that evidence out there sort of up front, and then we can have conversations about what we see next Thursday when we meet before we move into that sort of final summative evaluation, if that's good for all of you. Great. So what is the milestone for next Thursday? So questions that we have yes and, and things that we want question. clarification on in looking at this things that you would like her to bring more evidence forward because some of this stuff is a little bit more behind the scenes than what we see some Correct. of it we yeah. see obviously day in and day out uh, but to sort of bring things forward we want more clarity on we're not you don't have to do the evaluation between now and then okay and then after next Thursday we will each do an individual evaluation and then one person, it's typically the chair, um, will collate them and make one document so that looking at the, it's a more a matter of kind of looking at everybody's and saying, okay, everybody thought she was proficient in this. Everybody thought mm -hmm. kind of like that. Or kind of looking at what the difference is. And I think typically you would kind of average where they are so that, you, so that it's one document. Yeah. The final document is a public document. Yeah. I believe the, I do not believe that our individual ones are public documents. That your understanding that is so true. we will have to clarify that we'll obviously clarify. Mm -hmm. as well but that's 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 not we don't have to do that until after next week okay does that and then typically MASC recommends doing it before an election so that the board does not turn over um, 
it's mm -hmm. unlikely, given that I'm unopposed, that I... <laughs> If I am voted right. off, <laughs> if I am voted off unopposed, I was not intended to be here. At all. <laughs> it would say volumes about how the town feels about. That. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, just because I never seem to get this right, so I'll just start asking questions now. <laughs> so there's a comment, and I remember this came up at the session we sat in on that um, for new superintendents performances on track like it for the needs improvement developing it seemed at that thing that we sat in that it's very common for new superintendents as we have one to maybe have areas that i mean just and it, it's a new superintendent sure. ha hasn't had an opportunity to master sure. right um so that doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing Right? It could, I mean, I don't know, like, I'm not sure what happens with this. Like, how does this then relate to, I don't know, performance? I don't know. What, what, how is this so, used? So, <laughs> it, this? I mean, what it's a public document. So, right. it, in the, on um, hopefully, not circumstance in which Dr. Kavanaugh was looking for another job, for example. Right. Um, which we hope is not the case. Um, a, poten a potential future employer could, I'm sure, access this in some way and right. say what was the... Uh, it also, I would, I would hope the primary purpose of it would be to inform kind of Dr. Kavanaugh is looking towards next year and kind of what reflecting on that and yep, that piece of that. Would that be your understanding? Yes, I think, you know, for some of these things because... You know, you're in the <coughs> very first year of sort of doing some of these things. There are some of the areas that I mean, maybe a, to give an example would this would probably be I guess sorry, I'm just while you're looking. I'm, I ask that because I don't in that we turn this over to one of us who then averages them and right. whatnot. I just want to make sure that whatever was intended to be the meaning of a rating is clear. Because yes, if well, it, if it's seen necessarily as like negative, if, you know, there is I wouldn't you know if that's not how it's intended. I want it to be clear that it's positive, but a growth. So, area. Well, so my my takeaway from looking at all of this stuff was that anything that had anything other than a proficient rating requires a comment. Yes. So that those comments, I think, really need to be part of. Okay. what goes along with it so that that would be okay my hope the other option that we do have is and i i did actually have some communication with Dorothy presser mm -hmm. if we had the appetite or the desire to speak with her i could see you know kind of where that, that yeah. yeah maybe a good example if we looked at standard four <coughs> if you look at standard four b cultural proficiency ensures that policies and practices enable staff members and students to interact effectively in a culturally diverse environment in which students' backgrounds, identities, strengths, and challenges are respected. Like, I feel like in that one right there, we are really in the incipient stages of doing something, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. But then if we look at standard 4C, demonstrates strong interpersonal written and verbal communication skills, I think that that's sort of one that would probably be Unchanging. Right. I mean, you either yeah. do, you don't have those. Right. 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 So, I think that's kind of where you <coughs> would. Okay. So, for something like 4B, you may want to say to me, "Can you sort of help me understand how things are going in the schools, so that you know we do have those things at least started or yeah. developing, or where do you think you are in them?" But I think with something like 4C, you'd know the answer. Yeah. You yeah. would either say yes or no. Good. I don't think it's. You don't mind anything. No, no. I don't think it's dissimilar from the way that we evaluate teachers because the, the um, standards are very similar in okay. nature. And so when you're evaluating a first-year teacher, we have to decide if they're proficient or needs improvement. And if a first-year teacher receives a needs improvement, they're in jeopardy of not being reemployed. That's the way the system works. And so what you might as a school um, leader or evaluator do in those situations is decide overall, has this person made proficient growth? based on where they are in their career, based on the work that we've seen so far, and do we believe that their work so far is going to lead them to become what we believe maybe a veteran teacher would be in the area of proficiency. Okay. And sometimes as the evaluator, you acknowledge that in your comments. 
So either through a conversation with the teacher or through some written comments that you provide um, in terms of areas. Yes, I, I believe that this would be a proficient um, area overall, mm -hmm. but these are the things we'd like to see moving forward. That's helpful. That's so, and you've had experience doing this uh, as a school committee member as well, so that actually is helpful and perspective we, we for all We follow of us. that same, yeah. or we have anyway follow kind of that same philosophy. That's really that helpful involved. because it's not necessarily how, like in, in other industries, yep. it would work. You right. know, and you might, right. in another industry, you might have needs improvement, just, you know, you're, you're you know, it's not, it's not innate, you would never be at jeopardy of losing a job, right. you know, so it's good to have that insight. Oh, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So any questions or requests for evidence by Tuesday would be great. So thank you. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much. And that brings us into school committee policies on the website. Oh, that's me. Um, you know, I printed this off <coughs> and I left it at home. But I did send out to you. And this is yes. not something that the um, working group on policy, which is Jen, Dr. Kavanaugh, and myself, think needs a vote. That This is all clerical stuff, but we want to just raise awareness of what we're doing. We started on a journey of trying to simplify the numbering scheme for our forms and procedures. We already have a taxonomy for policies, which is given to us by MASC, but when there are related forms and procedures, they had suffixes like a dash one, dash E1, dash R1. Didn't make any sense. Nobody knew why they were what they were. So we decided to just make those more understandable. So in doing that work, we went through the policies, the whole list of policies, looking for references to forms and procedures. And we also have on, in our manual, some of the forms and procedures are just listed right like policies. And so it's kind of a mishmash where you're trying to, to stream it, streamline it. It kind of mushroomed a little bit <laughs> in that we found um, there were some references to forms we don't use any longer. There are some forms that appear in different um, versions in different parts of our website to the community and so forth. So it's a big cleaning effort, but it's very timely because um, as we clean everything, when we cut over to the new website, we'll cut over hopefully with clean policies. So all that said, you have been provided with a list of um, forms and procedures and policies that need some minor clerical changes. So on the list, you'll see a policy Usually it says change the cross-reference to something dash E1 to something dash FRM for form one. Um, and that's the kind of clerical change that sort of propagates throughout the whole manual. Um, they're just tedious, it's just detailed, tedious work of just checking cross-references and sources and sending poor Dr. Kavanaugh off to tra chase down forms and things that we don't know <laughs> if they exist. And so it's, it's purely clerical in, in nature. We do have a few things that cropped up that are more substantive that are not on this list that will come back through regular process if necessary. So um, if there's no objection to our making these clerical changes, we're going to just hand this list off to Georgette is going to be so happy. And then um, broke the news to her. <laughs> and we had uh, Mr. Ghosh met with us as well because he's overseeing the conversion to HTML and um, he's kind of not that anxiously awaiting these changes <laughs> to come through to him too. So um, they're eager though to have the, us approve them and okay so they get started. So unless there's any concern about what you saw we're just gonna pass it forward. Please do. I, I am more than good with all that. Yes. And I, I really, I sincerely appreciate that, all of the work that you guys have done. It's fun. Together. <laughs> you fun. say that, but I worked on this group with you last year. <laughs> that was last year. It's Amanda this year. We <laughs> 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 really ratcheted it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody's it's gonna gone up take over because it's gone up so high. Sorry. Right. That's right, Amanda. We're just going to get all clean, and the next year's <clears throat> working group will be something else. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you guys will do really well again next year, I feel confident. You will. You will. It's good, though. And I think, you know, for most importantly for the community, if you're looking for a form or a procedure or it shouldn't be hard. And we're hoping that it's a lot easier to find things. And when you find it, you have the right version. And this it, it's work that's worth doing once every eight or nine years. So, so we don't really need a vote. Okay. Any, any questions or anything? But no questions. No. no. Okay. None. All right. Thank you very much. Thank You're welcome. You. So that brings us up to um, 
mitigation monies. I'm not skipping anything, am I? No, brings us up to the mini mitigation monies update. I don't have a huge update since we all know um, that, but I did want to just put it out there for our viewers at home that the mitigation monies update is a reference to the uh, mitigation money from the host community agreement with Legacy Farms. And there is a an article on the town meeting warrant for the creation of a stabilization account for that money. Uh, and there's also a, a motion within that um, for us to have $200,000 that we will have access to for um, mitigation related expenses that we will undoubtedly, based on your presentation, incur yes. um, more rapidly than not. I think actually the 200000 is a very conservative mm -hmm, um, yes. number Sounds of like what it. we're actually going to be needing. But we also want to make sure that we're able to preserve uh, some money for years to come because this impact is going to continue. But it might be worth it just for the viewers at home to just mm -hmm. explain what they're going to be voting on. Um, so, just give a heads up because I think it is a little bit confusing if you haven't read so yes yeah, so I don't have the the article in front of me to go through each thing but there will be the one one piece of it will be to cr the creation of the stabilization fund another piece will be for the five hundred thousand dollar payment uh, that has been it, for the funding to go into the actual stabilization account and I, I think also for viewers at home what the stabilization account part of how it works is that it us for us to take money out of it, it will require a two-thirds vote of annual town meeting or if there was a special town meeting, but two-thirds vote um, to withdraw any money from it. It only requires the 50% to get it up and, you know, funded. So there's that is one piece, and then there is a piece for us to withdraw some money, to pull some money out of the stabilization fund this year. And then there, in subsequent years, um, we will continue to look at what our needs we anticipate growth related to legacy farms is in whole or in part mm -hmm. um, because obviously one thing we had discussed is that it's not possible to just kind of separate out if we had to hire a teacher for example mm -hmm. we aren't putting all legacy farms kids in that classroom so that it, it could be a really triggered by the fact that we've had growth from legacy farms but that one teacher is not going to be teaching just kids from legacy farms obviously right. or if we needed an oven for example at one of the schools because we can't cook enough meals uh, because of the increased growth related to that. We're not just serving kids that have come out of that development. So, yeah. so just, and so the stabilization fund, just to make it clear yes. for people, is we'll hold the money from, if yes. approved yes. at town meeting, we'll hold the money from Legacy Farm, the initial payment and future payments. Yes. And sit there and accrue interest and whatnot, and then at a town meeting, special or, or annual, as we need to access that money, we will request it from the voters. Correct. And typically the school committee would ask for that request, but the town's the town account would have to be approved. Yes. The school committee's yes. request before it gets to town meeting floor. Correct. So and they the town accountant look back to the charge of all of this to see that we are in fact meeting it and we're not doing something outside of the scope of what the intent of the stabilization. So there's sort of a lot of layers with school committee, town accountant, two-thirds vote of town meeting. Yeah. So there is a lot of scrutiny, I think, over the money. Yeah. But it can't be used for any other purposes than the schools. So that's a great question, actually. Um, I think people might want to know that answer, too. So, yes. So the intent of it is to be used by the schools, but a stabilization account by law, um, the town could vote by a two-thirds vote to change the purpose of the stabilization fund down the road. That is... Which is in slight contrast to the original intent of the host community agreement, but we're going to have to... Correct. Hope that our voters stick with us, is what it comes I, down to. And hope that the voters recall in years to come that the intent of this money was for the mitigation related to legacy farms, that it was part of the host community agreement in which the money originally would not have had this level of oversight um, because it would have just been under the direction of the school committee for a number of reasons um, that has had to shift as we're aware but um, that's you are correct is that why you asked us to tattoo the MOU on our back <laughs> <laughs> so in future years people will know forehead forehead so everyone can oh, see okay. oh, 
So, and I think that's why the MOU will be important to remind people because there's some institutional, you know, knowledge that could be lost if our whole board and the board of selectmen turns over, um, because this the money will continue to be triggered to go into this account for every um, what is it blocks of thirty right blocks of 30. every block of thirty kids going forward will trigger an additional payment into this account and up until one year past the issuance of the last occupancy permit. So is it four years out that they're projecting to still continue building or did I make that up in my head? Is that you would know that answer better than I would. I, I mean that it's approximate but you know it could go faster or it could go slower. Okay. But I and think it is it, sorry. One thing about the MOU is that it's only binding with the committees that actually engaged in it at the time. Yeah. So if you know, the Board of Selectmen changes or the school committee changes, then, you know, so it is a nice historical document, but it won't bind forever. Yeah. So I think it is important, though, for um, yeah. folks <coughs> to recognize that it's good. a lot of people have asked me, you know, right. hey, how's it going with all this growth? And here we are, you know, facing um, over half of our anticipated growth for next year has already hit the books. So we're... Yeah. We're facing extreme growth, and people said, "Oh, but you have all that money," and it's, they're wondering if we've used it. And I think it's important for people to know that um, we we have been very fortunate, and that we did receive the town did receive payment from Legacy Farms, and there's a future stream of payments anticipated because of, we've already met the growth targets. But in order for any of it to be accessible by a school committee, people have to go to town meeting and vote to create the stabilization fund and vote to approve funding it with the money that we've received, the $500,000, and then vote to release 200000 of it to us to access for next this coming fiscal year. So if people are wondering why we haven't used the money, or you know, I think we don't have the money, we don't have the money to use it unless they go to town meeting and vote. I think that's and important. That's, that's a very yes. good point. So and just, I, I think back to your point that people are asking, you know, saying that we have all this money to mitigate the growth, but we have um, these students that are coming in and they are staying for, you know, their duration in the public right. school system. 13 years. It's the 13 years, right. um, if you look at $14,000 per pupil, and I know that our cost is hopefully a little higher than 14000 but it um, that money is not going to come anywhere near right. covering okay. what the actual costs are. Um, and it's important, too, you know, we want to maintain our public schools at the people moved here for the public schools they didn't move here for the public schools to fall apart because we couldn't fund them so we've got to be responsible with the money we have and we have to use it to to offset it and we're going to have some challenging things with our facilities going mm -hmm. forward in the capacity um, in multiple buildings it's the MOU did finally get all put together and off um, but that's going to be probably five years out, even if we called in now. You mean for L1? I'm sorry, for yeah, yeah, Did I say, I said S-O-I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or S-O-I. 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 Statement of interest. Yes, yes. There's a lot of initials getting thrown around. But it is a lot. Yeah, the statement of interest is going out, but it's that's not going to help us um, if we have 200 kids come into Elmwood next year. Uh, class size is important. And yes. physical space, I mean, that's you can't have billions of kids in one classroom. It's true. I think we, we do a great job, I think, of protecting the classroom experience from this growth as much as right. possible. But even even if we can do that, I mean, all the other, the hallways, the classrooms, the busing, right. the, I mean, the, the lunchroom, I mean, there's a whole lot of infrastructure that is just tight. Right. It's really getting squeezed. Right. And mm -hmm. as we look at, like I said, over half of our anticipated growth is already in the schools or, or, or on the way. Um, it's a little it, bit it's alarming. daunting. Yeah. It's daunting. And th so. this was a big, for anybody who watched last night, the Meet Your Candidates program, it was a big thing on people's minds, uh, just yeah, right. questions as well as candidates, what they were saying. So and People do have a lot of questions. People have a lot of questions, uh, and people are looking to us to do things responsibly, but also to keep the schools in the same level of excellence that we have come along for a number of years mm -hmm. now. That's that. So that's so we'll see everybody at town meeting. See everyone at town meeting. <laughs> yes. And also Please. just a Please. plug as well um, for the Know Your Vote program that's happening on Monday mm -hmm. at 630 yes. uh, through EHOP. That's always a great uh, program for people to get more information on things for town meetings. So.
And this will be covered, most likely, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I'm sure That's there will so be. Um, and Carol and I will both be there. Um, great, great. And I'm running great. sound. Oh, fabulous. <laughs> I provide sound equipment for that. <laughs> So if I start to say something that's really bad, you'll make the I sound just mute go it. away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Susan as well. And Susan yes. as well, yes. That's good, because there are a lot of things that I would not be able to speak to. Mm -hmm. That's why I said, you'd know the answer to that better than we would. There's nobody so, left uh, that way to look at either. It's like the buck stops there, Susan. <laughs> Anybody, yeah. You better have me. Yeah. <laughs> so at this point it, in our meeting, it is time for our uh, next opportunity for public comment. Unless anybody sees anybody lurking around the corners, we seem to have lost our public. Um, we need like a cliffhanger to get people here. Like we're going to announce <laughs> something really exciting. And you have to be in the studio to get it. <laughs> I'll have a giveaway. A giveaway. There we go. All right. And that brings us to items by consensus. All right. So as superintendent, uh, I recommend the school committee approve the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. So moved. Motion by Jen. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. And uh, I am also an aye, so that is... So moved, and then at this point, I would seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion by Amanda, second by Meg. You look no. like you were going to pause there. Motion by Jen. I, what did I say? I, Me. Because I was looking at you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am all kinds of mixed up tonight. Feel I free to I'm not sleeping enough. Motion by Jen and a second by Meg. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. And we are adjourned. Our next meeting is next Thursday, uh, May 2nd at 6 p.m. We are having an executive session at the beginning. As you will recall, we are at the high school library and then again on May 16th. So thank, thank you, you all and have a good night. It's going to be.